Uh, I think this project is by far the most complex in terms of engineering gymnastics of, of, of any building, certainly that I've, I've been involved in. This building is, um, I believe, it's unparalleled in, the, in its complexity, certainly within, within Australia. And if you look globally, the only building that sort of similar to this is the is, is the CCTV headquarters in Beijing, where you have the the double double cantilever. But even that, I think, is different because that building is double cantilever, but it's propped against itself. This is a, this is a completely eccentrically loaded building of of this sort of magnitude, the 22 meters. Yeah, it's certainly I, I struggle to uh, think of any building that um, comes close to its complexity. Oh, it was unique in that um, most buildings are, are, are concentric, so you have, a, you have a core, you have perimeter columns, and they basically stand vertical uh, under its, and under its own weight, they, they, they remain vertical. This building was unusual in that the requirement was to cantilever uh, 11 levels, approximately 22 metres, over the existing um, heritage existing heritage money box building. Um, the 1916 and 1933 construction was not um, able to take the load of, the, of any new, new, work, new buildings above it. So the part of the DA condition was that we weren't permitted to put any permanent load on the building. So the solution uh, that the architect architectural team developed was to basically cantilever the building, that is to, to construct uh, the majority of the building over the heritage building to be freestanding, to be cantilevered. We, we kept it extremely simple. The simplest form of a structure that cantilevers is the classic strut and tie. That's where you have a, a horizontal tie and, and a diagonal strut. That's the simplest form and we just took that simple form of statics. It, it's, it's, a thing, it's the first thing you learn in engineering school is the, the classic strut and tie and we just took that simple form and wove that into the, into the building structure. That strut and tire model had a lot of other advantages as well. One is that it made the building perform a lot, uh, a lot better in terms of long-term um, deflection, long-term movements. It also imposed less um, uh, space uh, imposition on the, on, the, on the net level area of the, of the uh, floors. And that was probably the main um, advantage from a commercial point of view for the ultimate client. The whole checking process was, was quite, a, quite an intense period of the construction phase. Leading up to it, uh, we had to do a great deal of our own uh, quality assurance to make sure every weld had been tested, every, every, every part of the fabrication process had been checked and, and, and double checked. We then workshopped the whole um, process in terms of what the, what the expected movement was. So we, we identified that when that jacking process, when, they, when we lowered those jacks, that building would move a certain amount over. So what we, what we workshop with Grocon and what we ended up doing was building the building out of plumb. So we built it at, at a slight incline, approximately 35 millimetres at the top and 50 millimetres across the horizontal. So the whole building was built at that incline. When the jacks were removed, there, would be, there was an instantaneous um, straightening of that building and we spent an enormous amount of time trying to determine what that movement was, would be. And we, have up, we had upper and lower bounds of what the expected movement would be because it went back down to how the material would work, how the material would perform. And the material we had upper and lower bounds of our understanding of how that material would perform. So we had a, we had a band that we knew that the movement would occur. Um, the risk was that we um, overestimated it, so the, when we took the jacks off, the building would stay um, at an incline. And the, obviously the other end of the risk was that when we removed the jacks, the building came down too much. So we had to get it right. And the whole de-jacking process was a very slow process. So we started at nine, and we, we, we lowered the jacks incrementally. We lowered it at five millimeter increments. We stopped, we went through the building and checked to make sure that there wasn't something adverse happening, there wasn't any cracking that suddenly appeared, there wasn't pieces of glass that started, started, started to dislodge. We, 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 we went through a very careful process and that's why it took 
till about three o'clock that afternoon for the whole uh, process to be completed and we brought the jacks down enough and the building had moved to pretty much where we, we predicted it to move to. And that whole process was, um, it was very intense, not knowing the final outcome. Uh, we were very confident in our figures, but it's more about, um, it's more the unknowns that you, that you always concern yourself with. To estimate the figures, you, know, you, you do the analysis, and the analysis is basically mathematical modelling. And the mathematical modelling is accurate, it's extremely accurate, but it's the input that you put in. It's those material properties that you input. And, and normal engineering um, tends to be a bit conservative, so we look at a material property and we'll say, how much can we load that particular piece of concrete up to? And what, what we'll do as engineers is we'll look at that value and, and there'll be certain material factors applied to it, certain safety factors applied to it. So we might have a capacity here but we only use this much in design, so we have that buffer. When we're looking at movements, um, and we're trying to make sure we can predict exactly what the movement is, we really want to know what the exact value is. We don't want to know what the conservative value is, we want to, we want to know what the real value is, and that's why we didn't quite know. We, uh, we knew the band of where that, property, that, that performance would occur. So we input in a range, we input in an upper range and a lower range. So we had a, we had a range of figures that we expected the building to move to. And that's, that's what was input into the mathematical model. And then from that, we were able to predict movement. So the, the actual modeling was extremely accurate. It was the understanding and, and, and making those correct selections of the material properties that were put into the model. And if I look back on my career, probably the most complex projects I've done have been with Grocon. And a lot of the people I've worked with, I've worked with for a long time. And there's, a, there's an understanding, and there's, there's, a, there's an understanding, there's a trust, there's a mutual respect, there's a mutual respect for each other's abilities. Um, so I think that if it's quite, if it's complex, I'm, I'm very comfortable that Grocon are there. That's, that's, um, that's the level of comfort I have in terms of implementing what are very, very complex engineering designs. We were able to be, be part of a, a design solution which had so many other benefits. So the, the, the main, one of the main reasons why the building was cantilevered and, and, and the form that it, that it took was it, it, it enabled natural light to come into the old atrium that was in within the old heritage building. Um, that, that atrium had been blocked up in, in 1990. Uh, part of this design process was removing those slabs and bringing the light into that, to that atrium. The engineering is great, but at the end of the day, it's the people that, uh, that work there that will use the building. And I think they've got a fantastic, fantastic facility. Um, the, the, the ability to bring the light into the building that was previously dark is, is, is certainly um, satisfying to, to us to be part of that process.